So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me here. Uh, my name is Michele. I'm a PhD candidate at King's College London, where I study smart cities through the lens of geospatial data. And today I'm going to present you uh, Python's geospatial ecosystem, so to speak. Um, first, a disclaimer this is a talk for beginners, so, welcome if you're a beginner. I'll try to give you top tips and, and libraries so that once you get out, you can pip install and get started uh, with Python and GeoData. Uh, if you're not a beginner, welcome anyway. Uh, it might be uh, maybe a bit banal, but please stay in this room for the following talk, who's going to uh, present some more practical applications. Um, today we're going to cover spatial data formats, uh, what to use, what not to use, um, coordinate reference formats, so map projections, which is quite a tricky subject. Um, we're going to do a bit of uh, analysis and visualization as we go uh, forward with, uh, with some data that we will download. Uh, live. Uh, so first of all, what is geographic data and why should you care? Um, it's really any data with a location component, any data that can be pinpointed uh, on a map somewhere on, on the surface of the Earth. And we can use it to, to visualize it, to analyze uh, therefore any phenomena that happens somewhere, which is quite a powerful concept. Um, there's many different types of geodata, uh, but there's two uh, main groupings, vector and raster, the difference being uh, vector data are discrete or can be uh, discretizable, uh, and raster data are continuous. Uh, let me do an example. For instance, uh, vector data can be points, such as you know, uh, crime locations, uh, pollution samples, or social media check-ins, such as these maps uh, made with Flickr data, geotag Flickr photos. Uh, it can be lines, such, a, such as GPS traces, or social networks, or um, commuting, uh, commuting patterns, such as this one. Um, there can be polygons, so country boundaries, city boundaries, uh, census areas, and, and so on. Um, raster data, uh, on the other hand, is, um, is really uh, images. So, so it's a continuous representation uh, of data where every pixel uh, has, a sort, uh, has a different information. In the case of remotely acquired satellite imagery, uh, it, can be, uh, the, it can, can be used for inferring the, the land use of a particular area. So in the, in the case of, the, of this image, if the land use is, uh, has vegetation or not, or the pixel value can contain the height of a specific location, and therefore the image becomes a, a digital terrain model. Uh, to model uh, the, the height of, of the terrain, or the pixel value can encode uh, temperature in a certain area. You get the idea. Uh, most of the time, though, unless you're a remote sensing analyst, uh, an imagery specialist, you'll work with vector data. So let's keep rasters for now. Um, and let's start with the most common uh, vector format, which is the shapefile. It's, it's a bit of a, an old format. It's called uh, amicably the um, the vinyl of geographic data. Um, it was developed by uh, ESRI, which is uh, the, the Microsoft of the geographic world, in, in 1998, so it's a proprietary, uh, proprietary format. Uh, and it's a quirky format in the sense that it's composed by at least three files. Uh, there's the .shp, which contains the actual geometries. Um, there's the .dbf that contains the information associated with that geometry. So think about the census tracts, the polygons that we saw before. You got an area, and that's the geometry, and you got how many people live in that area, and that's the, the associated information. And then there's the, the third file is the .shx, uh, which is just for indexing, basically. Um, optional, but quite important, is the .prj, which contains the data projection. And I can assure you, like 90% of the time, the .prj is missing, and you're going to have a hell of a time reprojecting the data and finding where the data is. Uh, therefore, there's this recurrent joke among JS analysts, geographic analysts, that 80% of successful geographic analysis is just basic, basically having a good folder structure. Um, luckily, the industry has moved on. There's, there's new formats, uh, such as GeoJSON, which, as you can see, is basically just a superset of JSON, which encodes uh, space. Uh, it's an open standard and supports different um, geometric types, geometric primitives, such as points, line strings, polygons. And um, being a JSON, being like a dictionary at the end of the day, um, you can, um, there's, there's key value pairs. And uh, for instance, uh, all the geometries are encoded in, uh, in a key geometry. 
and, and the associated values are encoded in, uh, in the properties, in the key property. Same as before, you would have had the geometry and the information associated. Um, it's the de facto standard of GeoWeb, um, and you can't really see it, but um, even GitHub uh, recognizes GeoJSON, so if you save a GitHub GIST, it automatically displays uh, a web map. There's plenty of other formats, um, Mapbox Vector Ties, XML, Geo for reference, the imagery, and many more. But don't worry, most of the time you're gonna work with shapefiles, vector ties, or GeoJSON. Um, one cannot cover geographic data types without uh, not mentioning OpenStreetMap, which is, um, which is a geographic database of spatial data, and even more so, um, it's a database created by a community, a volunteer community uh, of mappers uh, that, similarly to, to Wikipedians, uh, map the world. And um, you can see in this picture uh, the map and the associated raw data for it. And you can get the data because, um, well, first of all, there's lots of it. Uh, in its 12th year of existence, the project reached almost a terabyte of data, so in some areas is really highly accurate. Um, you can use it, as I was saying, because it has uh, an ODBL license, so it's really permissive. Um, and you can find it in, uh, you know, sliced up in, in different um, continents or uh, countries or metropolitan areas. But you can also query for individual features using uh, the awesome overpass API. There's a web-based tool that you can use. Uh, here I'm querying for all the restaurants uh, in Milan, for instance. Uh, but of course, there's Python bindings. So. Uh, just, you know, uh, pip install uh, overpass and then um, instantiate the class and then you can uh, instruct uh, your class to, to query. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm looking for uh, the restaurants in Florence. So I say, error name is Florence and I want to get all the nodes that are restaurants. OSM is a bit uh, weird in that sense. There's, the geometric primitives are, again, points, lines and polygons, sort of, but they're called uh, nodes, ways and relations. And, and the associated information uh, is encoded in, in key value pairings. So in this case, I want to get all the amenities of type restaurant. And I want uh, all, uh, all these key value pairings to be nodes. So I'm querying all the nodes that are restaurants. Um, you know, just uh, launch, the, launch the get request and, and you got a nicely formatted ge uh, GeoJSON in response. Uh, let's just save it for, uh, for later use. And, and then we get the data, but how do we use it? Um, enter GeoPandas. So I guess, how many of you uses or have used pandas, the, the regular one? The majority, of course. GeoPandas is the special extension, so to speak, of, of pandas, uh, because it, it understands geography. It encodes the geographic information uh, in, in the geometry column. Um, with shapely data structures. So that means that uh, you can compute you know, geometric operations such as finding points in polygons or overlapping features, whatever, using shapely, which is another library. But you know, that complexity is masked by, uh, by GeoPandas. Uh, again, easy to use, just import it, and let's reload back the data that we saved through the read file method. Um, and there we have it. Uh, Notice that I'm using, you know, iLock, similar as I will do for, uh, for a pandas data frame, just to, to slice up the, the columns, that there's loads of them. And you can see here the geometry column. And you can see that, you know, uh, we created for nodes, so we got in response the points. And, and you can see these numbers, these are the uh, coordinates of the points, so latitude and longitude. And, and the rest is just, you know, normal, uh, normal attributes. We're talking about restaurants, so for instance, we got information if the restaurant accepts certain credit cards or not. Um, talking about geometries and latitudes and longitude, let's, let's move to the you know, coordinate reference system part. So what is the main problem cartographers are trying to solve when you know, working with um, CRS, coordinate reference systems? The main problem is to transpose, to represent our reality, which you know, lives on a sphere, uh, onto the flat surface of a map. And there's different ways to go around it. Uh, Either you know this quite impractical one-to-one -one representation suggested by Louis Borges in his novel, uh, or you can carry around a globe at all times, which is also quite impractical, or you you can use projections. And there's different uh, there's different kinds of projections. Um, there's azimuthal projections that maintains the direction. There's conformal projections that maintain um, uh, the local angles, therefore the shape. 
does equidistant, it maintains the, uh, the distance from the center or equi area, they preserve the area of a certain feature. Uh, you don't really have to, to remember all of these, but just pay attention to the fact that every projection carries itself a trade-off. You cannot keep preserve all these, all these properties at, at all time. So if you consider um, Web Mercator, which is the projection used by, by Google Maps power, that powers Google Maps, uh, Web Mercator is a conformal projection. So it preserves angles. And, but, but the trade-off is that it distorts areas. So if you think about uh, you know, the usual map that you see, uh, Google Maps are really everywhere because it's, it's really, uh, Mercator projection is probably the most diffused, uh, the most famous projection. Usually the, the UK at high latitude, it's this you know, really long and stretched country, but uh, if you move it back next to the equator, you can really see that you know, comparatively speaking, the, 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 the sizes of these two countries are quite different. Uh, and that's, that's the actual area. Uh, so in a sense, projections always carry a, a trade-off and can be highly misleading, and there's lots of implications for it. Um, so then you might wonder, well, well, well you know, which one should I use? There's really no right or wrong. Just uh, pay attention to, to these details and, and try to obviously use a projection that's, that fits your local data. Um, all these comics and, and references are, are linked in my, uh, in my presentation, so if you can't read it now, go check it uh, later. Um, okay, how do we deal with projections from a, from a Python perspective? Uh, again, thanks to Geopandas, it's quite straightforward. First of all, let's check if the data already comes uh, with a projection, with a coordinate reference system. Um, because each, um, each Geopandas uh, instance has a, has a CRS method. In this case, we can see, in fact, that uh, it, it already has uh, this EPSG 4326, uh, uh, which is this global latitude and longitude projection. Um, so, and it, that's the one used by, by GPS, by the way. Uh, so let's say we want to project it uh, from a sphere to, to a flat surface. Um, we can use the two CRS method just pass a dictionary with a new projection, in this case 3857, and you got your projected data set. Uh, and you can see, remember before, uh, the points were uh, 11 dot something something and 43 something something, that's the latitude and longitude of Florence, and now we got uh, these crazy long numbers, which is in, in kilometers from the uh, reference meridian. So it's actually being projected on an XY um, Cartesian plane. Okay, we got the data. We learn about uh, projection quite briefly. Um, how do we you know, display them? Um, well, there's loads of different kinds of, uh, of you know, maps and the kinds of maps. Uh, we cannot cover all of them, of course. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, dot maps uh, I, because I think they're quite compelling. They're quite beautiful. But at the same time, they can be a bit misleading in the sense that they can suggest densities where there's really no density. In that case, you might want to use maybe heat maps, which are the appropriate kind of visualization for visualizing density in space. Um, equally, if you're, uh, if you're dealing with you know, discrete features, uh, you might want to use color flats. So to communicate the, the value of a certain area, you use a shade of color. And or an another funkier option uh, is to use cartograms, which uh, also uh, you know, are applied to, uh, to discrete areas, but in instead of communicating its value with color, you distort the shape, so you got these crazy distorted shapes of countries and cities. Uh, and there's loads of other ones like spatial networks and so on. Um, today, to continue working with our, um, our da data set of restaurants in Florence, um, we're going to visualize them and do a quick, a quick and dirty exploratory uh, data analysis by visualizing them, first of all, as heat maps, because, again, they're points. Um, so let's import mapbox.jl. What, what, what is Mapbox.jl? It's, um, it's basically the Python wrapper for Mapbox.jl JS. As the name implies, uh, originally it comes in JavaScript, and luckily there's Python binding for it. Uh, why JavaScript? Because uh, usually uh, these days most maps are, uh, are interactive, and therefore they are web-based. Uh, so you need to use JavaScript. Um, it's quite straightforward to use. Uh, you need to get an access token, uh, so you, uh, you need to register on their website, but then uh, you know, just import the heat map fits class, pass in um, the reference to the GeoJSON file, the, don't forget the access token, and then some, uh, some variables like the, the, the color stops, 
um, and the, the intensity of, uh, of the heat map. Also, don't forget to center your map and, and pass in appropriate uh, zoom level. And, and there you have it in a few lines. Uh, it's fully interactive. Uh, it's 3D in a sense. Um, and you can see like, you know, from, from this quick and dirty analysis that, as you might expect, there's lots of restaurants in the city center near to, uh, near to Piazza della Signoria um, and, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, uh, nearby here. Um, there's a problem with heat maps. Most of the times, they are quite meaningless because they're just basically uh, population maps. So they are nice, they're easy to make, uh, they're they are compelling, but as this funny comic reminds us, you know, the, the, the actual meaning it can be misleading. Uh, so this is not necessary, this is not uh, enough, uh, let's, and therefore let's move to a more meaningful uh, visualization, uh, such as uh, a choroplet map. Choroplet is a funny name, it comes from, from Greek, choros means uh, area, uh, and plat many, so it's many area maps. Uh, and uh, as I said before, each area is, is shaded proportionally to the measured value. Um, there's two problems with that. First of all, they depend on the resolution of the area. So obviously, uh, breaking down the observed phenomena with large polygons is different than you know, encompassing it with uh, smaller areas. Uh, this means that coral plates are sensitive to classification and to the different coral scales that you use because uh, the color shades is the way you communicate that value, so uh, small discrepancies in, uh, in, the scholar, in the color scale can really make a difference. Uh, I know programmers are lazy, I am myself, so I always go uh, to these two links to, to check for uh, nice and easy um, color scales to, uh, to use. As I said, uh, color plates are quite um, sensitive to classification problems, so, uh, for instance, let's say you have a highly um, skewed distribution in your data, then perhaps using an equal interval to, to bin, to categorize your data, is, uh, is not the, the you know, most effective solution because you're basically just, uh, you end up with, uh, with some bins that are, that are empty and you might want to use uh, another algorithm such as natural breaks that you know, fits more uh, to your uh, skewed distribution. Um, Let's, let's try to do that in Python, keeping in mind these two, uh, these two pointers. But there's a problem. We got point data and core plates are areas, so we have to you know, uh, translate that information onto an aerial, uh, onto an aerial map. So uh, yesterday I downloaded from the Italian Open Data Portal the, the shape file uh, of uh, census tracts in Italy. You can read it again using Geopandas, same as before you read in GeoJSON. Now you are reading a shape file, if you remember, dot .shp. Quite easy. Uh, you can subset it to, to take only the census tract in Florence using the zip code information. And again, this is just like using Pandas normally. Uh, there's also a handy plot method that you can use uh, to you know, make a quick visualization just to see if everything is correct. Uh, and then we can uh, try, to, trans try uh, you know, to put that information contained on the points on our error features, but there's a problem. The coordinate reference system don't match. That, all, that happens all the time when working with geographic data. Uh, luckily, we saw before how to bypass this issue. Um, you can just, uh, well, first of all, you can um, check if the two uh, reference systems are um, are different, and in fact, you can see that one is the 4326 that we saw before, so the data are projected uh, on this global sphere, and 32632 uh, is the Italian projection system, so that's the discrepancy. Um, we, we saw before how to go uh, around this. Uh, we just need the, to use the 2CRS method to reproject our data back in um, in latitude and longitude, basically. Uh, but it's quite easy, just one liner. Now that we joined our points on the polygons, we, we can see and count how many restaurants are in each census tract. Uh, that's just a quick group by, and you can see, for instance, this, this census tract has nine restaurants, this other one has six, and so on. Um, this is just a bit of housekeeping. I am uh, joining back this information in the uh, original census tract uh, the data frame, basically. Uh, let's quickly plot the distribution, and yes, it's highly unskewed. So as we said before, um, if you want to visualize it with a choroplet, 
we might not want to use uh, an equal interval classification, and maybe uh, a gen classification is more appropriate. Um, notice that this time uh, I'm also using Mapbox gel, but I'm importing the, the Coroplet bits class. Um, and then I'm just running this gen classification on, on the density column, on the, on the column in which I save the count of restaurants in the data frame to, uh, to produce these, uh, these data beans. Um, then again, let's, uh, let's use this class, reference the data set, uh, pass in the, the column where you store the, the count, pass in the color stops, uh, classified as we said, and, and the usual, the zoom, the center. Um, and what you got is, once again, uh, a nice color flat, fully interactive, again 3D, so uh, in this case, the, the, the shapes are also extruded. Um, these maps uh, are just, I mean, Mapbox Gel, as I said, is basically a wrapper for, uh, for Mapbox Gel JS. So what you got here, it's, um, it's a WebGL environment. So the potentiality of this environment uh, are huge. You can load loads, you can throw literally huge data sets and, and they will uh, manage to, to display them. Uh, so they're quite you know, uh, easy to use, but also powerful. Uh, and I think uh, this is kind of my final slide. So to sum up, we saw three main libraries. Um, Overpass, GeoPandas, and uh, Mapbox.jl uh, you can use to, um, to download that sweet GeoData. GeoPandas to, you know, is the cornerstone of the spatial analysis in Python, so you can use it pretty much for, uh, for all, everything. Um, and Mapbox.jl you can use it to display that data. Um, there's some libraries I didn't manage to, or didn't have the time to go over, uh, such as PySol, the Python Spatial Analysis Library that allows you to do like spatial regressions or check for autocorrelation in spatial autocorrelation in your data and so on, or Asterio, uh, that's that's widely used to work with uh, geographic um, georeference imagery. Uh, with this, I conclude and I thank you. And. I <laughs> Thank you very much, Michele. Uh, do you have any questions for Michele? Great. Hi, and thank you for the talk. And I, I didn't get a point. This, the subdivision of Florence City was based on streets or is based on zones? Uh? Um, so census tracts are in Italian, uh, are sezione um, censimento. Okay. So they are the statistical unit uh, the Italian government uses to I don't know, like count the population or uh, to basically is the special uh, unit of reference for any kind of um, statistics the Italian government does. And these data are uh, these data are in um, OpenStreetMap uh, are by Istat. Uh, where did you get them? The restaurants are from from OpenStreetMap, and the uh, the areas uh, are from the Italian census. Okay. And so you can combine multiple you know open data to come up with quick analysis. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. So, uh, I saw we are using Jupyter to make the, the example. Yeah. Uh, I also use Jupyter. At some point, if I have uh, large maps, uh, I, <laughs> I need to wait a lot of time. Yeah. So what is your advice about large maps uh, and so on? Um, well, there's there's a, there's a data format I didn't manage to, to explain in detail, uh, the Mapbox, Mapbox vector tile format. Um, that's the, the new kid on the block in a sense. It's been around for a couple of years now, uh, but it, it's a compressed uh, format and um, it really revolutionized the, uh, the way we, we work with large data set. Um, it, it decouples the styling of your data from the actual raw data uh, and it's highly compressed and uh, it's packed into tiles. Um, and on the on the client side, also here in the Jupyter notebook, at the end of the day, it's just a wrapper. Uh, on the client side, you got uh, WebGL, so you know you're using the the, the, the graphic um, power of uh, of, your, of your GPU to to display um, to display your data. So you can you can throw at it uh, larger quantities of data, and it will still be able to to work pretty much smoothly. So uh, yeah. Another one? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, are you aware of any uh, tools that you can use to maybe simplify the geometry of a shapefile? Because maybe you have a, 
a really big shape file and you really don't care about the super good resolution and you want to yeah. simplify them? Um, there's another format I, I didn't mention. There's so many formats. Uh, that's called uh, TopoJSON, for instance. That's uh, you can use it to simplify your your GeoJSON. Uh, it's uh, the, say the topological version of, of GeoJSON. Um, there's a few examples by uh, Mike Bostock, who's the the author of D3, uh, about how to use it, when to use it, and and that's one of the main applications. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used it, at, and like it's a like a command line uh, tool. Yeah. You can use it also yeah. with, with JavaScript. But uh, are there tools in Python? Um, too, there might be like a porting mm. or what. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I also use the, the command line mm. one. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Other question in the back as well. Okay. So. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Do you think that? Uh, to get um, a longitude or latitude information of a place is um, is more uh, is uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, if you take OpenStreetMap and Google APIs, for example, which one is more re reliable to get uh, um, good uh, longitude or, la or latitude uh, of a place? Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Um... Well, it depends on, on the area, I would say. Um, OpenStreetMap through the years, uh, as I said, it's now in its 12 year of existence. In, in some areas, for instance, in Germany, the German community is highly active. Uh, it's, the, the map is really detailed. And the funny thing about OSM is that it's, you know, everybody can map whatever they want, in a sense. So you got uh, these, uh, these really you know, anal and peculiar guys who are attached to, I don't know, mapping power lines or mapping uh, men also mapping street lights, uh, so you got even you potentially can get even the most tiny detail of a city, uh, and that's stuff that you certainly won't find on, on Google Maps so far. Um, so so it depends on I guess your use case and and the location that that you're working on. Okay. Thank you so much again. <laughs>